Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Grove. I'm going to try to turn these lights down one more time. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Well, if Jimmy Henning has been here since uh, dirt was new, I've been here since the rocks that made the dirt were new. <laughs> but that said, um, I want to also acknowledge my co-author here, Chris. When um, the news about rising fertilizer prices broke, Chris came to me really early and said, we really need to work on um, providing information that's relevant to forage producers. And that's what kind of crystallized all this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different strategies that you might use to improve fertilizer use efficiency in a pasture or hayfield environment. You saw some of the latest data when Nick uh, presented fertilizer prices. This is the latest as of the 12th of this month. Urea is now at 99 cents a pound. If you take the nitrogen value out of the DAP part of it, it's at 55 cents per pound of phosphate. That's actually no change for the last couple of months. The rising price of DAP has been entirely due to the rising price of nitrogen. Phosph uh, potash has gone up a little bit, 67 cents. Now, the real key thing to see here is that there's been very little price move in the last 30 to 45 days. I don't know that it's peaked, but it's certainly starting to plateau. As Churchill said, we might be, you know, we're not at the end. We're not even at the beginning of the end. We may be at the end of the beginning when it comes to prices. When it comes to nutrient use efficiency, you really have four basic areas of trying to improve your management. In the soil fertility world, these are called the four R's, trying to improve the rate, getting the right timing, getting the right source, and getting the right placement of nutrients in the context of the system you're in. Now, the four R concept has been largely used with row cropping, but I intend here to use it in a pasture system, particularly hay fields also, but in a pasture system, you don't get just to consider soils and plants. You have to also consider the animal. Because as Dr. Henning points out, the animal has a large role to play in how that cycling occurs. And how you, as the manager, how you manage the animal has a large role to play. Critically important, beaten into my head in the early years when I was a new assistant professor by Chuck Doherty, Putting nutrients on to grow grass you don't need at a time you don't need or where you don't need it gives you losses. So if your first flush of grass on a cool season environment is going to be adequate, you don't necessarily need that nitrogen in March or early April. Maybe you ought to wait till that's been used up, harvested, whatever, and you maybe need some more coming into June. So maybe you make your first nitrogen fertilizer application mid-May, late May. So you always have to be thoughtful about your own individual situation. And by individual, I mean individual pasture, because not all pastures are used in the same way at the same time. And there are other considerations. I've listened to my colleague J.D. Green, who's a weed scientist, make really good cases where You'd spend a heck of a lot less money if you used a good herbicide protocol because you got more grass from that than you'd get from the same amount of dollars put in fertilizer. Now, you, again, you've got to know your own individual situations, but again, it's an important trade-off. If I can get another ton of dry matter from grass by doing better weed control, and that costs me $35 an acre, but it's going to cost me $80 an acre of fertilizer, well, I know where I'm going with my buck. Retailer gets it anyway, but he's going to get less of them. In pastures, the nutrient removal is very much animal driven, and with cow calf production in particular, the amount of nutrient removal in milk and meat is really rather low. I'll show you some numbers in the next slide. Other losses, though, that I have sometimes seen in certain pasture environments can be fairly significant. You can get some pretty serious erosion losses where you're not doing a good job of managing cattle traffic. 
runoff, where the runoff water can carry some of the soluble nutrients. And in some fields where we've let the pH particularly get low, we're going to get chemical fixation of otherwise available soil nutrients. The nutrients are there, but the pH got low and converted those to chemical forms that were not as bioavailable. So the crop's got to fight for it. And every ounce of energy that a crop uses to fight for a nutrient is an ounce of dry matter that you're not going to get for the cattle you're trying to grow. So we need to avoid the erosion and runoff losses with a particularly robust forage stand that's managed well so that we don't abuse it. We want to slow that water movement, get more infiltration, and we want that stand to be robust enough and active enough to quickly take up soluble nutrients. This comes, the data comes from John Laurie here at the University of Missouri, but the slide was put together by my colleague Chris there. We have the various imports that come into a pasture environment, in the cow-calf environment. We have fertilizer if we use it, definitely the manure. Dr. Henning talked about legumes and the nitrogen fixation, and in some cases we're using a bit of supplement. And if we manage all that well, we can get that out there in the pasture and have less of it on feeding pads. I have a cattle operation. I use both feeding pads, and I also use bale grazing. My problem is I have a lot of soils that are fragipan. When they start wetting up in the late fall, early winter, there's no amount of bale grazing. It isn't going to pug them. So I have to I move off of that to a feeding pad. But I have a feeding pad that I clean regularly. There are a few days in January where it gets above freezing, and I can make a manure spreader work without breaking it. But and I have a ground drive. Okay, I'm not I'm not big time here with one of those whirly gigs that I saw at the trade show. The exports, you cycle as many nutrients as you can, but what you export in calves and beef is really a little heavy on nitrogen and phosphate, but it's not that much in pounds per acre per year. Now, being a soil scientist and being a soil chemist and being in soil fertility, I'm just going to flat tell you, you can't manage a nitrogen, uh, sorry, a nutrient problem without a soil test. I don't care how high fertilizer prices are or how low they are, you still need to target where you're going to put or not put. Because remember, not putting a nutrient on a field is a management decision. If you don't have a basis for that decision, you're not doing as good a job as you could be if you had the information. It's not a perfect tool. Every field does tend to be fertility unique, but there are good general principles that we hope to relate here. And I think it's especially important when fertilizer prices are high because I'm going to target my lime and my fertilizer applications to those fields, either pastures or hay fields, where I'm going to have a greater potential for an economic, profitable response. The most critical step isn't what the lab does. It's the first step. It's where you take a sample, it has to be representative by space in the xy direction and by depth in the z direction. When we say four inches, we don't mean four to six. We mean four inches, maybe four to four and a half, but we don't. I mean, I've watched high school kids take samples for dealers in the field. They get those big football players, and in the morning they're pulling them eight inches deep, and by the afternoon when it's hot, sweaty, and nasty, it's, it's three inches. Well, what's the quality of that data for you all? Absolutely nothing. You want to have 15 to 20 of these cores, and you want to have them put in a common plastic pail, no metal, please. You want to have a high zinc test, do a galvanized bucket. You're going to get a soil test report. This is a typical UK one, although some of the counties have got more modified ones that look prettier, but bottom line is this is a fairly typical one. So my question to you all is, you've got the result. What's the very first thing you should be looking at? You've got data here on phosphorus, potassium, pH, calcium, magnesium, zinc. What's the first thing you want to look at? pH. Some of you may have heard me before. There you go. 
we need to advance the state of this area, that's for sure. This one is in pretty good shape. Soil pH is 6.4, the buffer pH is 6.9, the lime recommendation is going to be pretty low. In this case, it's a ton per acre. Anybody got a guess why it's a ton per acre at a pH of 6.4? It's an alfalfa grass system. If it was clover grass, that recommendation would be zero, because clover works fine at 6.4. Alfalfa works better at 6.8. So you're going to get a modest lime recommendation, because the system the grower reported on the form was an alfalfa grass <laughs> system. The reason soil pH is so important is because it has such an impact on the other things you're trying to do well in the hay field or the pasture. By the way, as far as we know, on limited price surveys, ag lime is widely available in Kentucky. There have been no notable price changes relative to pre-COVID, except where you get delivery and you have a, a diesel fuel problem, a diesel fuel surcharge. We have seen some prices increases related to that. But when you buy it at the quarry, it's been about the same. But the liming of acid pasture soils or acid hay fields is a very high priority because you can get a lot more bang for the buck. We need to maintain the optimal availability of the other nutrients, especially phosphorus, but also potassium in that field environment, and lime helps do that. You need Dr. Henning had a question at the end of his talk. You need to maintain legume numbers. You need to maintain their growth. And by the way, nitrogen fixation itself, the function of those rhizobium in those nodules, is benefited by having an adequate pH. 6.2, 6.3, 6.4 for, for clovers, 6.7, 6, 6.8 to 7 for alfalfa. If we look at a number of nutrients, what we see here, there's along the top, it talks about soils ranging from strongly acid to the right, strongly alkaline. If we look in this middle area bounded by blue there, you'll notice these width of these, we call it the missile diagram in my trade. The bottom line is they're wider, and that the width of it is an indication of availability. So you'll notice in that region there, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, all these things tend to be wider as we move from very slightly acid to very slightly alkaline. Some of the micronutrients we want to be honest about, iron, manganese, boron, and some of the others, it helps to have a little bit lower pH. But for now, we don't have too many problems with those. There will be problems. But the wider the band, the more plant available. So we need to maintain pHs in these environments between 6 and 7. 6 to 6.5 if it's red clover you're working with, 6.5 to 7 if it's alfalfa you're working with. Okay, enough on liming and pH for a while. What's next? What are you going to look at next? Probably phosphorus or potassium, depending on what's worse. Well, in this case, phosphorus isn't really too bad. It's 39. Potassium is not very good. What are we going to do? We're going to use the soil test information, and this is where we hit the first R. We're going to change rates. Well, the rate is by far the easiest thing to adjust, and you can put what you need where you need it, field by field. The probability, as I said before, of an economic response to that fertilizer application is strongly related to the soil test level. If the soil test is very low, say low to mid-medium, is your likelihood of a response greater to the applied fertilizer, or is it lower? It's greater. And it's likely to be, even though it's more fertilizer, it's likely to give you enough dry matter to be economic. But if you're in the mid-medium, high to very high, your probability isn't that good. And I'm going to show you some things to illustrate why. <clears throat> Toy swears to me that this is not the cause of my computer. You know, it's the cause of my computer and not his. But his is a Mac and mine is a PC, and I still say it's that darn Mac. But anyway, going to the table here, 
the probability of a profitable response isn't zero. There are cases where the salt test is high that we see in economic response. I'd be a liar if I didn't tell you the field data didn't show that. But it's 15%. You go to Vegas, the house wins. This is the one where the fertilizer dealer wins. You get into the mediums, okay, maybe in the medium minus you get to 50-50. But when you get to low and very low, you'll really move to where flipping the coin is in your benefit. The reason for this lies in two factors. The first is this one, the law of diminishing returns. The first graph over here on the left is for phosphorus. You can see that basically what happens, this is relative yield, what happens is it comes up and it levels off. Now there may be some benefit in here. You may get enough dry matter per unit amount of salt test P and adding fertilizer, but it's still pretty shallow. Down in here, you get a lot more bang for the buck. This is the same data for potassium, okay? Potassium's not the same shape as phosphate. Wouldn't expect it to be. But the bottom line is, there are certain cases, particularly with alfalfa, where this response is actually fairly significant. So you might want to actually consider potassium for an alfalfa environment if the salt test is in that range, that lower, particularly in the medium range. But in general, what we're telling people this year to help weather these situations, if your salt test is in the medium, particularly mid-medium up, don't apply. UK's normal cutoff is right here at the medium high boundary. We go to zero at this point. I'll show you some illustrations in a minute. Now we're saying we really would not recommend at these prices fertilizer P or K if your salt test is in the medium, particularly mid-medium down. Here's another reason, the second reason. That previous figure represents the average of a lot of sites. Well, that average means, in fact, that, okay, when it's very low, they all look like they gave a great response. By the way, this is a different salt test extractant. In the low region, most of them, but not all, there were some that gave no response. And by the time you're up in the medium, you've got a few that are great and a couple that are slight. But by the time you get into the highs, there's almost no site at all that was giving a response in this set of field data. So even though you have a line that looks like it's a profound, it's really got a lot of noise in it. And in that noise is a lot of fields, are a lot of fields, sorry, that will not give you an economic response. When fertilizer prices are the way they are now, that's not something that can be easily afforded. Hay fields are a different environment for a darn good reason. One of the guys that was mentioned earlier is a guy called Ed Rayburn. He now bale grazes back in, not his pastures. His pastures are built up. He bale grazes back into his hay fields because he wants to put the nutrient back. But most of us are in a situation like I'm on my farm where my pasture is actually not quite as good a shape as it needs to be. So I bale graze in pastures still. And then I take the manure from the heavy use area, the, the pad, and I take that and put it on the hay field. But the bottom line is, hay fields, you're going to get more nutrient removal. You see some of the data here. And you're going to have to think about the fact that removal means your soil tests are going to drop for P and K. And you're going to have to monitor that closely. If you're looking at multiple cuttings on my hay fields, I'm a three cut person. I'm looking at splitting particularly K, P not so much, but K, I'm splitting across those, across those cuttings. So let's go back to this. <clears throat> We've got a 39 here on the phosphorus and 169 on potash. So where does that put us? Like I said, the phosphorus wasn't too bad. It's in the medium range. This year, I'm not applying any phosphate to one of the past, uh, hay fields that I have that actually tests in this range. I'm not doing it. But the potash is bad. What do you do? Well, you don't put it on all at once. Split it. 
That way you change the timing to get a little better efficiency. And I'm going to cut back. I'm not going to use 300 units in this environment. I'm going to probably drop it by 50 or 60 units and split it three times, one for each cutting. Now I know I could end up with a drought, not get as much in, say, the second or the third cutting, particularly the third one, which is often taken off after stockpiling. What if the field was a grass clover pasture with a soil test P greater than 60 or soil test K? Well, UK would recommend zero. That's the UK table. That's what they recommend is zero. But now what we're saying, let's move down. In this region right here, look at all these soil tests between 41 and 60. That's 20 soil test units on phosphate. It's 30 soil test units on potash. And they makes the same recommendation across all this, 30 pounds P2O5 or 30 pounds K2O. You know what that is? That's called maintenance fertilization. Everybody says that UK is conservative, that they never recommend enough fertilizer. Everybody that sells fertilizer says that. <laughs> but it turns out we understand the limitations of the data. My colleagues and I understand that limitation. So we do have what I call the insurance range. That maintenance fertilizer is meant, if you don't take a representative sample and you got a lowish area, you're going to get a response in that area. And it might be enough to cover the cost for the other parts of the field. So we've got insurance built in. But this, do you think this is a year you can afford insurance fertilization? Trust me, I should see more shaking heads this way than moving heads this way, OK? Some people say, I want to keep the fertility in my soil up for the next generation. My recommendation is, Put your money in the bank, and even if the interest rate's at 2%, you're going to do better than what you're going to get in the field. Because the same amount of dollars put in the soil bank account pays nothing but negative interest. You can't hold it. It's going to get fixed. It's going to get eroded. It's going to run off. The bottom line is you can't do anything to even keep it at 0% return. It's going to be a long, slow slide to the negative. In fact, that chemical, and in the case of things like nitrogen and sulfur, it's also a biological uncertainty, makes the soil fertilizer bank much less valuable than the dollars in the bank. And in general, we find that doses of needed fertilizer are more efficient than doses of maintenance fertilizer. Now, you could have another soil test lab. There's no name here. You could have another soil test lab, pull the, pull the sample or take the sample, and you're going to get a recommendation. Here's a salt test phosphorus that's 199 same units as UK. UK says no P after 60. This one's 199. And right down here at the bottom, you have a 60-pound phosphate recommendation. Up here at the top, you have 344 potash. UK cuts off at 300. Down there, you've got an 80-pound. <coughs> potash recommendation. This is a year to have a heart-to-heart -heart with dealers who pull soil samples for you. If they're pulling the soil samples, tell them, tell them. You have to tell them. I want a UK recommendation with every one of those soil test results. I don't know of a lab that can't generate that. It's just a computer program. The two bigger private soil test labs in the state have it. They have a program that would generate a UK recommendation. You tell the dealer, you can either generate it or I'll take your results and I'll go down to my county agent and let him generate the result because they can do it too. They have to put the numbers in, but given the amount of money being saved, it might be the best use of their time, dollar per hour, of anything I've seen agents doing. By the way, that's my personal belief. So Brandon, don't take me to task, okay? Timing, These, another R. Lime needs time to neutralize soil acidity. Raising soil pH is not a quick reaction. It's slow. Technically, it would be wise if you had all your lime on by now. Organic nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and poultry litter, if using that, needs to be biologically mineralized, so it needs to go on a bit. Soluble fertilizers, particularly nitrogen, should be used on time, neither too early or too late. Remember, if you're growing warm and cool seasons and grasses, I have both on my farm. I have Bermuda grass, eastern gamma grass, and then a fair bit of fescue. 
the timing of nitrogen in these environments is not the same. This is a figure I got from Chris. We've got two grass types here, a tall fescue Bermuda grass, sorry, a tall fescue Ladino clover mix and then a Bermuda grass. And you can see that when it comes to, you can time it here, here, but Bermuda grass is going to be there in order to get it done. So you can't just do a one size fits all if you're going to really improve your fertilizer use efficiency. Chris and I have a study, this is mostly Chris than mine, but we're looking at a little bit of a late nutrient addition because in our environment in western Kentucky, fescue hardly ever goes totally dormant like Bermuda grass does. So maybe we could get some extra tillering that would take advantage and give us some greater growth in the spring. Urea is the primary nitrogen source being used if you buy a fertilizer. It is particularly ugly in terms of volatilization losses. Losses are driven by an enzyme we call urease. It is pretty much ubiquitous. It is on the surface of both living and dead tissues. And if those surfaces are moist and the ambient conditions are warm and breezy, you can get volatilization of 20 to 30 percent of urea in a week. Losses are less when it's applied prior to May 1, or at least when it's cooler, because the enzyme is temperature-dependent kinetics. So when it's cooler, the enzyme can't work as fast. It also helps if you have somewhere between a quarter and a half inch of rainfall within 72 hours. I time all my ureas. I have a cooperative fertilizer dealer. I time it all so that it's raining within 48 hours. No, and I have a smaller farm too. The other option is to use a urease inhibitor. Urease inhibitors are kind of like people. Many are called, but few serve. So please remember, use a product that has NBPT in it. And it has to have an adequate concentration in it to effectively protect the urea. It'll give you two to three weeks Two weeks of good protection and a third week of half, half protection. When it comes to the source, I'm all with what Chris, Jimmy has told you. I really think your pasture nitrogen is best provided by clover. That's one of the recommendations I got from Chris, so take it for what it's worth. But the bottom line is I really believe as a source, it's a superior source to expensive fertilizer. Because it improves the quality of the pasture, it improves animal performance, dilutes toxic tall fescue, and you heard from Jimmy about the new things they're learning about isoflavones. If you do use nitrogen fertilizer, remember you don't see a salt test for nitrogen on a UK salt test report because there's no good one. Organic matter is half-baked, so we don't use it for much. The UK rate wrecks, are, however, are in a range. So if UK says, for this situation, you need 40 to 80 pounds of nitrogen, and nitrogen is expensive at a buck a pound, I'm not going to be using 80. I'm coming back here. I'm going to come back towards 40. Nitrogen drives grass growth, so make sure, again, that you time it in such a way that you're going to have forage that you need and you're going to utilize. Otherwise, it's going to get mature and not be as valuable to you. When it comes to placement, particularly in pastures, means uniform nutrient distribution. We're not going to do what they do in row crops. We're not going to band it below the surface. We're not going to slice it in or anything like that. It's having uniform placement. To do that, we have to get animals to more uniformly dung and urinate in these pastures. You can use rotational grazing in summer, fall, and early winter, and then use bale grazing in fall, winter, and early spring. Now, as a soil scientist, I have one caution, which I exercise on my own property. Bale grazing needs to be done on the wettest prone soils first. Do it in the fall, going into the winter, because once it gets soggy, you want to move off those soils and move it to upland or better drained soils that you won't pug as easily if you want to keep on bale grazing into, say, February, early March. But it is a tried and true technique. I just don't have enough of those soils on my farm, so I put in a pad for those other months. 
Now, I'm going to give you a list in red titled of the things to avoid in high-priced fertilizer years. Actually, you should avoid these at all times, but particularly now. When it comes to the lime, pelletized lime is way, it's a good product, but it's way too expensive for a pasture or hayfield environment. Suspension grade lime, another good product. Liquid lime, it's something being sold. I won't even deign it by calling it any kind of a product. Triple 19, 923, 30. Unless you need all three of these, these are things to avoid. Anybody know how they make 923, 30? You take a ton of 1846 and a ton of 0060, you blend them out together, you get 923, 30. Then you put, a, put it in bags and put a fancy tag on it, and man, you can sell it for a whole lot more. Buy what you need and put it where you need it. Don't fool around with these sulfur, copper, iron, manganese applications without a supporting plant tissue analysis because we don't have a valid soil test. And there's no private lab that has a valid one either for the state of Kentucky for soils they're in. Low analysis, microbial products that are too good to be true is dry fertilizer replacement. Eh, can't replace it. Forage is grown with pounds of nutrients. Tens to hundreds of pounds. You can't get that from low analysis or microbial products. Liquid humic acid, humus, humates. Remember, if the soil has 0.1% organic matter, 0.1% means it has 1,000 pounds. What are you going to put on from organic matter in a jug? It's going to change that. Chemical, biological, fertilizer, additives that make fertilizer and nutrients more available. I had a guy who wanted me to test his product. He says, you've got to put it in with the UAN. Microbial product you put in with liquid urea ammonium nitrate. I said, you do know they salt cure hams in this state. I took his money. We all take money. <clears throat> this is a product. It's a foliar liquid product. It's got a decent analysis, 1185, until you realize that all they want you to put on is one to two quarts per acre to alfalfa after each cutting. So how much is that going to weigh? Well, two quarts gives you half a pound of nitrogen, 25 hundredths of a pound of P, four tenths of a pound of K. It would take 10 gallons to get you up to about 5% of what alfalfa takes off. And the first two quarts cost you about 20 bucks an acre. What's 10 gallons going to cost? So my take home points, soil test pastures, use the data for your management. Apply lime, first thing off, apply lime to improve nutrient availability where it's needed. Don't apply fertilizer P or K if the soil test P or soil test K mid, medium, or higher until prices moderate. And I don't know when they will. And I don't know how far they're going to, but nothing cures high prices like high prices. That's the status of my economic knowledge, okay? Time those lime and nutrient applications to optimize either cool season or warm season forage growth. Avoid urea volatilization losses. Frost seed clover into pastures. Use the lower end of the range and recommended nitrogen rates and be sure you need that forage. Implement rotational grazing to improve dung and urine distributions, feed hay on pastures with low soil test values, and move hay feeding points around the pasture to improve the nutrient distribution, and avoid products that are too good to be true, promising a greater availability of a small nutrient quantity as a substitute for much larger quantities of fertilizer or lime. Thank you very much, and hopefully Dr. Teutsch says I still have some time for a question or two. Yep, you got 10 minutes. Hey, don't leave yet. I got $100 to give away. So if you don't, who's got the uh, tickets back there? Larry, they're under the speaker. The what? Over here. Speaker. Oh, there they are. Okay, great. Anybody have a ticket they want to put in? Yeah. Jimmy, can you go around? So I'll take questions while he's taking tickets. Yeah. Question? Um, I'm going to defer that a little bit to my colleague, Dr. Teutsch, who's got a lot more experience repairing pugs, but I think I know what he's going to say. He's going to say clover, clover, and clover. <laughs>
Yeah, so, so the question was about hugging in pastures. And the best thing to do is try to avoid it. And I know we can't always try to avoid it. So we're going to get some damage, uh, especially around areas of heavy use. So where we fed hay out and so forth. We actually have a publication called, we actually have a publication called uh, Repairing uh, Damaged Areas and Pastures. And that's available on our, our Forages website or if you go to the Extension website and uh, Google that, you can pull that publication up. There's a couple of different approaches. A lot, of, a lot of times in the spring, we'll try to reseed a cool season grass legume mixture, say, as we get into late spring, early summer. That usually doesn't work out as well as we think. So a better alternative may be to go with a warm season grass in those areas, an annual grass, sudex, crabgrass, pearl millet, or something like that. And then that's going to give you some good summer growth. It's going to utilize those extra nutrients that are available in those heavy use areas. And then we can come back in late summer or early fall and reestablish our cool season grasses and have a lot less weed issues there. Sir. There is two kinds of there, what they call, uh, the question was, am I saying that liquid lime is not that effective? If it's a suspension grade limestone, meaning it's ground up limestone and it's put into a suspension, it will be effective, but the rate you're going to have to apply is going to be very high relative to the price of the product. It's priced about the same or more than pelletized lime, which is three to four hundred dollars per ton. Remember, it takes a hundred pounds of calcium carbonate to neutralize two pounds of soil acidity. 100 to 2. Now, if you apply a product that they call liquid lime but is really no more than, say, liquid calcium, a lot of those products don't have any liming agent in them. The calcium, the magnesium, is not the lime. It's the hydroxyl, the oxide, the carbonate, or bicarbonate that's actually neutralizing the acid. You could have sodium with it. You don't have to have calcium. So the fact that you've got a liquid calcium strongly suggests Many of these products used to be calcium chloride. And they were priced in such a way that I would tell producers, well, if you really want to try one, go to your uh, county road commission and tell them you want that liquid calcium stuff they spray on the roads because it's exactly the same stuff and it's a heck of a lot cheaper. Or you could buy tire ballast because tire ballast is calcium chloride. But now tire ballast has changed. It's calcium acetate. Okay, But acetate is no better doesn't form anything that's going to make it make the soil pH go up. We bought a product. Dr. Ritchie bought a product with Dr. Teutsch's help. Bought it in a jug. Student pulls a sample out and decided, well, I'll just check the pH of that product. Now, you would think if it's going to raise the pH, it should have a high pH itself in the jug. pH was 4.76. Trust me, you can't get a product to raise soil pH if it comes out of the jug at 4.76. So most of those liquid products, and I'm going to be polite here, aren't worth a tinker's do da day. I don't know of one on the market that's worth more than the plastic in the jug. And plastics all have a bad name now. Sir. Corn silage is a high potassium requiring crop. So same rules do not apply. Phosphorus, you could probably get away with it if you're in the upper part of the medium range. But silage is a real potassium demand item. So you're going to have to put some of what's recommended on, maybe all of it, depending on what kind of, how hard you're pushing for yield. And that's going to be determined by the rate of nitrogen you're using. So does not apply for corn silage. You're going to have to put, you get away with medium on phosphate, but you're not going to get away with medium on potash. In fact, UK makes additional K recommendation for silage corn because of that. There was another question over here. Sir.
<laughs> a man's got to know his lim limitations. Eastwood said that once in a good movie. So, so the, the question was about Buttercup. And Buttercup is an indication of, of uh, a heavy use area or an area that's often overgrazed. Commonly seen in horse pastures, right, that are overgrazed. So the best thing you can do is get something established where that buttercup is that's going to help exclude it. The best defense against weeds and pastures is a healthy and vigorous sod. Uh, buttercup usually shows up in the spring, and we can spray it with 2,4-D and control it. And um, two applications of 2,4-D times two to three weeks apart is going to be really effective on buttercup. But we're going to leave an open space where that buttercup was. And what grows in open spaces? Or more weeds. So, so the really the 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 end question. I mean, when we think about um, buttercup problems in pastures, we need to start with the soil test, make sure our fertility works where it needs to be, and then we need to think about establishing something after we control that buttercup that's going to fill those spaces in with a desirable forage. So the question was herbicides. Um, if you want to control uh, uh, perennial weeds in the spring and then immediately seed legumes, and it, there's probably not a lot of herbicides that's going to allow you to do that. And especially the more the more effective herbicides like Duracor or Grazon next um, are, are definitely going to have a restriction on reseeding legumes in those pastures after application. Anything on soil fertility, sir? That one I can take. The question was, after corn silage in the fall, the buttercup comes back on. Can we, you're, you were using a wheat or a rye coming in after that, but you were still getting some buttercup strength on that. The answer to that is yes. You can get your wheat or your rye up about a couple, three inches, and then you can apply a 2,4-D, and you can take it out without hurting the wheat or the rye. It has to be a couple, three inches tall. Yeah. That's a more dicey situation because that seedling is a little more tender in that situation. <laughs> right. Rye can outrun more things than wheat can as a cover crop, yes. Any other questions? Thank you all. Appreciate it much. Oh, sorry. That's a forage guy's question. No, it's fine. So, so, no, the question was, is will, will rye in a uh, pasture help smother out the buttercup in the spring? And the answer is probably yes. Anything that's going to compete with it. Now, the we often have the question of whether we can drill, say, a full season annual, so that would be rye, wheat, um, or other cereals, or even annual ryegrass, and establish tall fescue pastures. And the answer is, you, yes, you can drill it in there, but sometimes it doesn't work out quite as well as you think, because if there's a good sod in there of tall fescue, it's hard for those, even, even something aggressive like a cereal rye or an annual ryegrass to get established in that pasture. So it works best if we have a really thin area, and that may be where you may have more buttercups. Right? Okay. I say that what we, have, what we observe typically is that corn silage production, corn in general, is driven heavily by nitrogen. And one of the things UK has recognized is in that environment we have a higher potassium demand. Part of it is also that when you harvest silage, you take off a lot more potassium than if you take off corn for grain. 
So in that case, a lot of the potassium gets returned to the soil with grain production, but gets removed from the soil with silage production. Yes, they are somewhat linked together, but drought also has a major control over silage corn productivity. So I can't say I'm going to cut back potash because I'm going to expect a drought, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to say use the soil test to guide the silage potash recommendation, and you have to go all the way to the edge of the medium um, before you before you stop. You can't, silage corn is not one where you can cut back on potash very easily. Nope, I'm not linking nitrogen to potash because what if my soil test for K is already high and I'm putting on 200 units of N, I'm not going to throw on another 200 units of K2O just because it already is at 200, it's already at whatever potash level I got. Never believed in formula fertilization, bad chemistry. Bad juju. Sorry? Sure. Are there any other questions before we move on to the next phase here? Did everybody get their ticket in here? But before we before we draw for the ticket, let's uh, give all the speakers a big round of applause.